In this video, you're going to learn everything you need to know about fetching data in React so that you never have to watch another tutorial ever again. Data fetching implies that we're fetching data from some URL. This URL is typically an API that we're referencing, whether it's one we set up ourselves or accessing from somewhere else. In this example that I've set up, we want to access this API right here via this URL, which just gives us a bunch of posts back. I have it open here on this tab so you can see the kind of data that we are actually expecting. The primary way we're going to actually take the data from this API and load it into our page is via a use effect hook. This is so we can control when the data gets fetched instead of just fetching it on every single re-render. Just make sure you have the use effect hook imported into React code first and then make sure we have an empty dependency array here which means we'll just load data into the page right when we first render. The very first step in fetching any data will be to call a fetch function and pass in the URL you are using. The most popular method for this is by using a simple function just called fetch. There are also libraries like Axios that do the same thing, so it's up to you what method you want to use. But for now, we'll just start with fetch. To call fetch, we just type fetch like we would any other function and then just pass in the URL that we have defined up here. This fetch function actually goes out and retrieves the data from this link, but we need to take one or more steps to store this data in our program. One of the main methods for doing this involves using .then methods to capture the result. Fetching data from a URL is not instantaneous, meaning it can take time. Dot then methods tell the code to wait until the fetch is complete before moving on. To add this, we can add dot then right after our initial fetch call. So this fetch here returns a big object with all of our data. To actually convert this object into data we can use, we should first make up an argument name to represent this data, which most people will just call res. The next thing we want to do is call the dot JSON method on this res to convert our data into JSON format so that it's easy to work with. Next, there's typically one more step we want to consider in React. So it's standard practice to store this fetching data in React state once we've fetched it. We have a piece of state here that I just created called data, which we have just initialized to an empty array. Now that we have this state, the very last step would be to actually set our state to whatever we just captured. To do that, we can add one more dot then statement. Let's capture the JSON as just data, and then we will call set data and just pass in this data. And now that we've completed this step, we fully fetch data from an external data source and stored it in our React state. To show you this, I can map out each one of our pieces of data since it's an array of objects. If I go ahead and save this page now, you can see we now have all the data that we have fetched from this URL up here. It looks pretty ugly because this is just one giant blob, but it was a success. Using fetch and then dot then statements like we did up here is one way to go about doing this fetching process. But there's a more modern way to do this that looks a little bit cleaner in my opinion, and that's using async and await. Inside of our use effect function here, we can define a new function and we're just going to call it grab data for right now. And to make it async, all you need to do is add the async keyword out in front of it. Async implies that this function is asynchronous, which means that this function will run independently of other parts of your program, allowing it to run parallel with other parts of your code. The use case of this is if we have a function like fetch that doesn't run instantly. By using async, we're allowing ourselves to make functions that could take a longer period of time and not keep the rest of our program waiting. To set this up, we should first take our fetch here. Let's just control X, let's cut and paste that in here. And then for right now, I'm gonna just comment out these lines right here. If we're using this model of async and await, we wanna store the result of this fetch in a variable. So for right now, I'm gonna make a new variable. I'm gonna say let response equal this fetch call here. Next, we can mimic the behavior of dot then by using the keyword await, which is a reserved keyword to be used specifically with async. So we'll add await in front of our fetch. When we put the word await inside of an asynchronous function, we're telling our function to wait until the current line is complete before running the rest of the function. Because fetch doesn't happen instantly, we should add await in front of our fetch. Next, we need to do exactly what we did down here and then convert this into JSON. So if we're doing async and await, we can do it by making a new variable. I'm just gonna call it res for right now. And then we're gonna just call response.json to convert this into JSON format. And because of the way this response.json function works, we actually need to specify the await keyword in front of this one as well. The very last step we need to do is just to store this in our React state like we were in this line here. To do that, all we need to do is call set data and then just pass in the res that we have defined right here, which is just the JSON of this initial response. To make sure this function gets executed on the page render, we should then actually call this function here at the bottom of our use effect. If you want a full explanation of why we need to declare and then call the same function inside the use effect, you should check out my use effect video. Otherwise, just know that this is the standard. Now, if we go ahead and save our code and then refresh, you can see we're fetching the data and displaying it on the page the same way as before. 
The only difference is that before we were using dot then, and now we are using async and await, which in my opinion is a bit cleaner and more of a modern standard. One thing I highly recommend adding to your data fetching is a piece of state that keeps track of whether or not the data is loaded in. This allows you to change the behaviors of your page based on whether or not your data is actually loaded. The easiest way to do this is to just make a piece of state called is loading and just default it to false. Inside of our async function, right when it starts but before the data is fetched, we should actually set is loading to be equal to true. Because since we have launched our function, we now know we are going to initialize some loading. Consequently, at the end of our function, after the fetching has been done, we should also set is loading back to false to let our program know we're not currently in the process of loading any data in. And just to make this look a little nicer, we'll add some spaces in here. Adding this is loading indicator allows us to add a conditional statement in our JSX that checks if the data is still loading or not. To show you this concept, I just made a simple conditional statement down here that says if is loading is true, we just want to display this header that just says loading data. Otherwise, if it's false, we can go ahead and map our entries like we were before. If I go ahead and refresh the page and the data loads in again, you may be able to see that for a very tiny split second, the page says loading data before the data gets displayed on the screen. This fetch doesn't take a very long time, but to show you what it would look like, I could just go up here and set this is loading back to true so it never goes back to false. And then you could see it would show loading on data on our page. This is what it would look like if the fetch call had not completed yet. To make a web app look a little bit more modern, you can add a loading icon here instead of just saying loading data. I found this random loading icon online and I went ahead and plugged it into our JSX here. If we go ahead and save our page, you can see that we now have a loading icon on our page, which if you're still in the process of loading data, a loading icon like this is probably going to look a lot cleaner than just saying something like loading data. Now let's go ahead and set this back to false so we can just return to our normal page. The next thing I'd highly recommend doing to fetch data is error catching. Frankly, fetching data is far from perfect and can be prone to errors at any point in the fetch, whether from your end or from the URL you are pulling from. So anytime you're calling a fetch like function, I'd recommend you add a try catch block. To do this, you should wrap all the lines where you're actually handling the data inside of a block like this. So we would add try like this, and we could just cut and paste this inside the try block here. And every time we have a try block, it's going to expect a catch block as well. So we can make another catch block down here and we have to pass in what's called an error. So we'll just say E for now, which I'll explain in a minute. And then we'll have another block like this. One easy way to catalog errors in our programs is to make a piece of state for them. To do this, I went up here and already made a piece of state here just called error. And then inside of our catch block, all I want to do is set this error here to whatever E is. Now that we've got all this code here, here's how this whole thing works. We will try to run this chunk of code here. So whatever is in our try block. If the code runs as intended, we will never have to worry about this catch block down here. It will simply finish running and then set is loading to false as we specified down here. If, however, there is an error somewhere in this try block, we will immediately jump to this catch block here, and whatever error we will get will be stored in this E argument right here. Then all we're doing is simply setting that error to the error piece of state that we've made. If you'd like, just to make this a little bit more understandable, you can add another block with the try catch, just called finally at the very end here, and this will run regardless of whether there is an error or not. So inside of this, we can just put our set is loading equal to false. If we run this function here and there is no error whatsoever, then this code is simply going to execute and then this finally block will run, which will set our loading back to false. If there is an error somewhere within this code, we will go to this catch block, it will set the error, and then finally we'll set is loading to false. And then it would be useful to let the user know that an error has happened in the program. One simple way to do this would just be to go down here and make a conditional statement. We would say if error, and then all we need to do is just alert the user of whatever the error may be. To show you this in action, I could go up here and change this URL to an incorrect URL. So I could just remove this E here, go ahead and save this page. And notice now we have now have an alert that says type error failed to fetch. Now, anytime we have an error somewhere within the fetch, it'll catch the error and then display it to the user. So that user can see if anything has gone wrong. Let's go ahead and return this URL back to its normal URL. Go ahead and save the page and let's refresh it. And now it's back to normal. If we just take one moment to step back and look at our program, it seems that we've tackled nearly every problem we can think of. We're keeping track of the loading progress via this is loading piece of state here and using conditional rendering down here. We're also checking to make sure we don't have any errors in our code and we're making sure our sequence of data fetching goes correctly. One more potential problem I want to introduce to you is this. Imagine we have three other pages just like this one that all do some data fetching. What if we are on one page and then the data starts loading in and before we can finish loading the data in, we switch off that page and go to another page. 
Well, the data will actually still load in from the initial page, even if you switch to a different one. This creates what we call a memory leak, and this is generally not wanted in our program. What we should implement is a way to cancel or abort the fetch if we switch off the page, meaning if the component unmounts or re-renders. To do this, we can use refs, along with a built-in object called abort controller. We should first import useRef from React, and this will allow us to make a reference to abort controller. To set up our ref, we should just call this line here, which is just calling the useRef hook and initializing this ref to null, and we're storing it in this new variable we made called abort controller ref. Abort controller has a property on it called abort that we can call to abort the current request. It also has another property called signal that just represents if the request should be aborted or not. Abort and signal are the only two properties we care about right now. We should start by initializing a new abort controller by setting the abort controller ref.current equal to a new abort controller. And remember, anytime you want to access the value inside of the ref, you have to use dot current, hence why we have it here. The next step is to embed this controller inside of our fetch function. The method for this is to add another argument to fetch in addition to our URL here. It should be an object with a property called signal, and when implemented, it should look like this. We are basically passing in an object as the second argument, and it has a signal property, which we are just setting equal to the signal property of the ref that we have right here. Embedding this inside of our fetch call is what allows us to actually abort the fetch if we need to. Now we should think about when we actually need to abort the request. The request should be aborted if we're re-rendering or unmounting the page and no longer need the current request to finish. Lucky for us, we have an easy way to do this, which we can achieve by calling the abort method in the return statement of our use effect, because this return statement is only going to run whenever the component is unmounted or re-rendered as cleanup. And to do that, all we need to do down here is just access the ref and then call the abort function on our abort controller. Therefore, if this fetch were to take a long time and I unmounted this page by switching to another page, this return function would run and it would abort the request, thus preventing a memory leak in our code. The one tweak we need to make is that when an abort happens, JavaScript by default throws an error. Inside of our catch block up here, we should actually add a exception for an abort because we don't actually want to throw an error since we're aborting for a reason. To do this, we can just add an if statement and in this if statement here, we can say if the error is equal to abort error, which is the name of the error whenever something is aborted, then all we just want to do is say return. And in fact, just so we can show it out, what we'll is console log and say aborted as such. We saw a moment ago, I actually got a mistake on the page or an error. And I realized it's because in here, we should not actually be defining this abort controller in the top here. We should be defining it inside our actual function here. So in our use effect right here, we can just say like this, and then now our program is working as intended. Now, if we have any reason to abort the fetch request, we have the functionality in our code to automatically handle it. And that's it. We've explored two different methods of fetching, that being the dot then method versus the async await method, which we have done here. We also briefly talked about other libraries you could use for fetching like Axios. We've made our fetching able to detect and catch errors, have loading indicators, and use conditional rendering to display our data in the correct way. Data fetching in React can definitely seem like a daunting task, but hopefully after watching this video, you've gained insight on how we can fetch data in an uncomplicated and straightforward way. If you enjoyed the video and it helped you out, please consider liking and subscribing as it helps me out tremendously with the algorithm. Take care everyone and have a great rest of your day.